I am getting paid as the listing agent and the selling agent. Sarah, this is what I was talking about when you asked that question earlier. Now that 50%, remember how I said we split it? Only now 50% goes to the modulin group and the BAC also goes to the modulin group. All right, that is lim or limited agency, dual. You are working for two people in the same deal. All right, now dual agency limited must be disclosed and approved by both the buyer and the seller prior to you doing anything. So you have to have the seller say, yes, I, you can bring the buyer. And you have to have the buyer say, I understand it's your listing, but I still want to see it. All right. <coughs> so that is dual agency <coughs> must be disclosed. Undisclosed dual agency. Let me say it again. Undisclosed dual agency is the number one violation of most agents. They forget, they get excited. The buyer calls them and says, hey, I saw your sign. Can you come show me the house? And you run over there and you walk in the house with the buyer and you forgot to ask if it was okay. That's a problem. That's part of my job. So I can go, hey, Aaron, did you get the signed listing agreement? And she goes, yeah, I did. Cool. All right. So it, it, and it can be denied, by the way. I've had it denied one time in my career. One time. The seller told me, I say, I called him up and said, hey, I got a buyer. The seller said, you know all of my financial information. I'd rather you not represent the buyer. I'm like, okay. So I called my partner and said, hey, Betsy. You need to take Stan, the buyer, to see John's listing, and he's going to write an offer today. And I charged Betsy a referral fee, so I still made some money on it. All right. So they can say no. It must be disclosed and approved in writing prior to you actually doing it. You got to do it. So when the buyer calls you and says, hey, I got your name on the sign, I'm in front of the house right now. You drive over to the house and you say, hey, you know I've got this listed, right? I know you know you just called me, but is it okay that I have this listed? And they're like, oh, sure, sign the paperwork. Now let's go in and look at the house, all right? must be disclosed in advance and that takes us all the way over to um, the next thing disclosed dual agency uh, undisclosed dual agency there on page 149 now here's a loophole to this if you guys all work for me and christina has the listing Whose client is it really? Mine. And Charles brings the buyer. And Charles works for me. Whose client is it really? Mine. But because I can separate those two agents inside of my agency, that is called in-house agency or designated there on page 149 and is not, let me repeat, is not a limited agency experience. There is no form required for that. That is called in-house. It is not outhouse agency because that's shitty. Ah, you got that one, I see. All right. So, same buyer or same agent, buyer and seller is called limited agency. Same, two different agents inside the same agency firm 
is called in-house or designated. That is not limited agency. Thumbs up. All right. On page 149 is that term, the non-agency. We actually have a form for this because in today's world, <clears throat> they automatically default to being your client unless they say, I don't want to be. This is one of the major changes that you guys don't know since you weren't in the business. But in about 2000, they changed. It used to be client walks in my office. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Let me start again. A person walks into my office. We treated them like a customer until they asked to be a client. Flip it. Now, a person walks into my office. I have to treat them like a client until they sign this form that says they are a customer. Everybody get what I'm saying? So now the default answer is positive. You're my client unless you sign a non-agency form, then I treat you like a customer. That was designed to protect the client or the public which is the number one goal of license law is to protect the public. When we talk about the uh, administrative laws with the state, I will tell you then, number one law, number one rule, number one thing to think about, protect the public. Whatever protects the public the most is the answer on the test, all right? So this change, in essence, they think protects the public. Treat them like a client until they say they want to be a customer. And the only way they say that is they have to sign in your book a non-agency form that says, Cameron, you are not my agent. Good. I am now relieved of my responsibility to help you. Okay. Now, is this only when they walk into your office physically face to face, right? Right. I mean, if you saw a guy in the Starbucks ordering in front of you and you never talk to them, no, that's not. But if they come into your office and they go, hey, LaShawn, I got a question. And you, you are say, not okay, my You my are client. my client unless you tell me. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. I really want to work with Cameron, but Cameron's sick today. I just got want you to answer this question. Okay, sign this form so that you can never say, LaShawn had told me that and I'm now suing her. No, 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 no. Here's the form that you signed saying I'm not your agent. You told me Cameron was. Yeah, I'm treating you like a client, a customer. Gotcha. All right. Now, suppose they ask a question that requires client privilege. Like, I saw the house. I want to work with Cameron. He's sick today. Would they take less money on that house? And you go, I can't answer that. Right. I have a ethics liability towards Cameron because he is a fellow professional and you would not want me to violate professional ethics. I can tell you it's for sale, that's customer. I can tell you where it's located, that's customer, but I can't help you. And if I do help you, two things to happen. One, I just created implied agency and two, Cameron's going to come and punch me in the nose for talking to his client because I'm not supposed to do that. That is the number one violation. You cannot talk to another agent's client. And if I know that, I'm guilty of Article 1 of the Code of Ethics where I was soliciting another agent's client. So I literally would say, I can tell you where it's at. I can tell you how much it's listed for, but I can't help you. You got to call Cameron for that. Sorry. All right. It can get hairy. And that's where that, remember I told you that whole procuring cost thing you're going to argue? This is where it's going to come in. Let's uh, play that game a little further. Person comes in and says, hey, I want to work with Cameron. 
but I got a question. Oh, did Cameron show you the house? Have you signed any documentation with Cameron? Well, no. Then forget him. I'll be your agent. And now Cameron goes, well, wait a minute. I showed them that house already, and now you're writing an offer? I want to claim procuring costs. Now we have to go to arbitration and argue it. So that's why I told you, procuring cause is the number one thing you will argue. Just that reason right there. Or it, it could even be different. Let's do it this way. Client comes in and I say, are you working with another agent? And they go, no. And they're lying. That happens. So I take them to this house. I write an offer. Cameron calls me the next day and goes, dude, what the heck are you doing? I showed them that house on Friday. And I go, well, they told me they weren't working with anybody. And I showed them the house on Saturday. Who's the procuring cause? It could be an argument there. You know, protect, probably in that case, it's going to be Cameron. Was there a question, Cameron? Yeah, like. Is there a way to like track like other um, like agents records so you don't you can like prevent that from happening? Or no, is that, that would be I a cool do? idea. That would be a cool idea, but no, there is not. Oh, you cool. literally are held captive to the client being honest and forthright. Okay. You know, they literally could do, and I'm telling you now, I'm not joking. I have been involved in that conversation hundred times in the last 20 years where I get a call from Cameron's managing broker Raymond this is Cameron's broker we got an issue my client my agent showed your client the house yesterday you showed it today what are we going to do all right happens all the time because the client lied or <coughs> perhaps they just didn't understand that Cameron should have got paid. That happens a lot too. Clients don't really know how we get paid. They don't get it. That's probably in this scenario would have been Cameron's fault for not explaining it good enough to the client so that he, so that they would have said yes to me. But that's common, that happens all the time. So I get a call from Cameron's managing broker and typically what happens is depending on who it is and how much I like them and how much they like me, there's all kinds of deals that can be made, all right? And you can make anything as long as it still fits. So I could call, uh, Cameron's managing broker calls me and goes, what are we gonna do? Okay, look, here's what we'll do. I'll go ahead and finish this deal and then I'll pay you a referral for that. Or I'll send them back to you you pay me a referral because I wrote the offer. Or, screw you, um, we'll catch it up on the next one. Or, worst case, you're lying. Let's go to court and determine what the judge has to say who the procuring cause was. It could be any of that range in there. The good thing is, by the time you're a managing broker, most of the time, you have come to grips with the fact Hey, I might not like Cameron's managing broker. I'm making this up, by the way. But I know that I'm going to be dealing with them for the next 10 years of my life. Let's not make it adversarial and go, look, okay, I'm sorry. Um, I'll just pay you a referral. Are you cool with that? And he's like, yeah, let's not let it happen again. Sure, whatever. Educate your client then or educate your agent better and I'll educate my agent. And when it closes, I'll write you a check. Okay, goodbye. So that happens a lot. And like I said, I've had guys that are like, dude, I'm like, oh, sorry, I'll buy you a box of cigars. Okay. You can do anything you want as long as it's legal, ethical, and, and moral. I can agree to keep the client and pay you. I'll give them back to you. You pay me. I say, screw you. You're lying. Go to court whatever you guys want to do, all right? On page 149 is the termination of agency. Over on page 150, 
on page 150 in your book, I want